Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and welcome back to Ex Situ, Operation Wallace Ears online lecture series. This week we're heading to South Africa and learning about the conservation of elephants with Dr Gabby Terran, who's the research manager for WEI. WEI are our partner in South Africa and we've worked closely with them for the past decade on our projects over there. So I'll hand over to Gabby, enjoy the lecture and come back and watch the rest of our series. Hi everyone and welcome to my Ex Situ lecture which is entitled Elephants Return to the Flower Kingdom. My name is Gabby Terran and I am the research manager for WEI. And today I'm going to be chatting about some things I'm really passionate about, um, namely elephants, as well as plants and plant biodiversity. And also how WEI partner together with Opwell to conduct some really great research in South Africa. We partnered on a study in the Western Cape of South Africa to look at how elephants have returned to these areas after hundreds of years. And in doing the study, we were looking at how we can attempt to balance conservation, and that's conservation of both critically endangered landscapes and transformed areas, and how we can increase conservation of areas as well as animal welfare of particularly charismatic species such as elephants and with their particular special needs, um, as well as tourism. And all of this within returning elephants to a threatened biodiversity hotspot. And I'll be discussing what we mean by biodiversity hotspot. But first, a bit of background into Opwell and WEI. WEI are the local in-country partners in South Africa um, and we've been partnering together with Opwell for over 10 years and this makes us one of the biggest Opwell expedition countries because we see hundreds of students come through every year and we are at multiple sites across the country and my role as the research manager is to work very closely with the reserves to design research which addresses their particular needs. A lot of the game reserves um, we work in uh, don't have the necessary resources to conduct research and so together with Opwell we can mobilize large numbers of students to help with data collection and this really helps the reserves we're working in to conduct both very basic uh, wildlife research and also very applied conservation research. I work very closely with Opwell to put these research programs into place that are both achievable as well as enjoyable and how we can best use the um, large scale model to conduct really good research in big five areas. The data then comes back to me and I analyze it and we try and engage with reserves to see how we can address some of their challenges and this sometimes results in scientific publications like the study I'll be chatting a bit about today and also applied management reports. We operate in several different sites around the country. Um, our first site is up in the north, which is our Savannah Ecology site, which is in the beautiful Greater Kruger National Park. And here we look at basic biodiversity monitoring within this open system. So we conduct bird surveys where we count birds um, and see how the population changes between years, as well as looking at large mammals and how the populations are faring in terms of age sex ratios and um, herd condition and we also conduct vegetation surveys to look at how plants and trees respond to both herbivore pressure as well as climatic and other drivers. Our second site is our human wildlife conflict site which is near the urban centers of Johannesburg and Pretoria in addition to our savannah ecology um, methods that we use in our other site, we conduct very specialized human and wildlife conflict research. 
The reserve we work in is unique in that it has people that live and work within the reserve in close proximity to Big Five. And this presents a lot of different challenges, both for wildlife and for people. And they come into conflict in very different ways. And we're looking at some of the effects of roads and fences on both animal behavior and mortality and how we can mitigate some of these these conflicts in, in this reserve, which could be a model for future African reserves where people and animals need to coexist in very different ways from how we've been doing in the past. Our marine site is located in Sitwana Bay, where we have a look at reef conservation um, and dive training. And then our last site is our famous biodiversity hotspot site, which is about four hours outside of Cape Town, which is where I'm currently sitting chatting to you from. And here we look at how biodiversity um, in a very spectacular way can be conserved and managed with some very unique pressures. So a bit about my background and how I got involved in all of this. I came from a, an academic background. I did my PhD up in Northern Botswana, which has the privilege of having the largest and densest elephant population in the world. And my PhD focused on the riparian woodlands, which sees massive concentrations of elephants and elephant impacts, and how the elephants act in ways that may change biodiversity, in particular plant diversity, because elephants are keystone um, species and act as ecosystem engineers in that they can change the landscape around them. So for example, they're capable of killing mature trees, which no other animal apart from termites really can do. Um, what we found was that the biodiversity consequences are both positive and negative, but act in very complex ways in a very large system. And it's large over both spatial scales and temporal scales, hundreds of years. And this really whetted my appetite for looking at interactions between animals and their environment. And the apex of that being elephants um, and how they interact with their environment. So from very large landscapes and very large populations of elephants, I joined WEI and I established the research program where we partnered with the reserve in the Western Cape in South Africa, whose dream was to return elephants um, to the southern tip of Africa after centuries of extirpation. It's a very different environment which had not seen elephants for hundreds of years, but had been markedly transformed by humans. And this reserve set about increasing space for elephants by incorporating previous agricultural lands and bringing wildlife into the reserve um, and in the hope that Big Five tourism can be a sustainable way to conserve large areas. So they started with a very small population of elephants and we know very little about how elephants live in these landscapes and what their impacts may be, which led to the study. But before I go on to the study, I want to bring you back to the background that we must always keep in mind, that elephant populations are in peril and across Africa, their numbers have been declining. We didn't know by how much, and so a couple of years ago, the Great Elephant Census was launched, which attempted to count how many elephants were left in the continent. And what they found was staggering. They surveyed elephants in 18 different countries and found that the population was down 30% in seven years. And in some reserves, they've counted more dead elephants than living ones from their helicopter. This 
reduction in elephant population and pressure on elephant population is due to several factors, one of which being the ivory trade, as well as human-elephant conflict and loss of habitats due to um, people encroachment, as well as habitat change. So there's a real need to protect elephants within their habitat. And the ultimate goal would obviously be to expand the region where elephants can coexist in together with humans. On the top of this, we also have biodiversity hotspots, which are also in peril. Biodiversity hotspots, the term came about in about 1990, and there's two strict criteria to be defined as a hotspot. You must have at least 1,500 higher plants which are endemic and found nowhere else in the world. So extreme biodiversity. And you must have 30% or less of natural vegetation. So these areas are highly threatened. Um, and they've established several biodiversity hotspots around the world, um, 36 in total. These hotspots cover 2.4% of the Earth's land surface, but amazingly support more than half the world's endemic plant species, plants that are found here and nowhere else. And nearly 50%, so 43% of endemic birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And if you have a look at the bottom of the Africa, the very tip, you've got the Cape Floristic region, which is a biodiversity hotspot, and I'll be talking about that. Uh, the Cape Floral Kingdom, or Cape Floral Region, is one of the smallest floral kingdoms in the world. It is an area of extreme natural beauty, um, and it's home to the greatest concentration of plants outside of the tropics. tropics. This is a photo I took of um, mountains but very close to my home where I went on a hike last week. And you can see the beautiful landscapes where the shrub density and shrub diversity is incredibly high. This region contains the Fainbos biome. Fainbos is an Afrikaans word for fine bush, which describes the very small leaves of a lot of these shrub species which are found in these areas. In terms of major stats, the Cape Thorrell region is really interesting. It has nearly 70% of the 9,000 species are endemic and found nowhere else on the planet. And so incredible biodiversity, but also incredibly threatened. 30% of the CFR is completely transformed underneath agriculture and urbanization. And only 20% of it remains pristine. So the rest is intermediate in transformation and suffers a lot also from alien vegetation invasions. And with these pressures, it experiences the second highest extinction rate of plants in the world after Hawaii. This was recently published in a massive vegetation um, assessment uh, around the world. And so this very threatened environments need to be conserved and people do come to these areas to see the plants and to see the flowers, but that represents a fairly small portion of tourism. And the hope is that Big Five tourism and people paying money to come and see the Big Five animals, so lions and your elephants, for example, can be a way to convert transformed land into conservation areas. And this is a really interesting model, which we're trying to establish whether it can be sustainable over long periods of time. But wildlife tourism requires wildlife. So what wildlife can be found within Fainbos? What we know is that Fainbos is characterized by evergreen fire dependent shrublands. And these grow on extremely nutrient poor soils and in very mountainous regions. So what this means is that these areas never supported large concentrations of animals like African savannas did. But we know animals occurred here. For example, we can see cave paintings of elephants um, in the Cape region 
and modeling exercises can produce maps which show available habitat which could be suitable for animals, different kinds of animals from meso herbivores all the way to mega herbivores like elephants and rhinos. But what happened to all of these animals? Basically, they're because South Africa was established by European colonizers very early on from permanent European um, settlement in the Cape in 1652. People expanded up the coast um, and hunted large animals into extinction, both from food as well as for trophy hunting and expansion into farmland areas and several species in fact went extinct. On the top left you can see a drawing of a blue buck. Um, the last one was shot around 1800. The bottom left is a cousin of zebras known as the quacha. The last one was um, lived in about 1883 and this is a photograph of that last quacha individual in the London Zoo. And the middle is a last photo well, the photo of the last living Cape lion, um, which was brought to Paris. In terms of elephants, they disappeared fairly early on as well. Um, they disappeared from the Western Cape by 1800, apart from a very small remnant population, which took refuge in a forest area around the town of Neisner. Today, there is only one individual left in the Neisner forest, and it's a very sad um, state of affairs. And the extermination of elephants continued um, and spread into other areas of the Cape. By 1900, there were only 16 elephants left in a town called Addo, which is in the Eastern Cape. The bottom photograph there is of a major Phillips Pretorius who single-handedly in 1919 reduced a population of about 130 elephants to the 16 elephants in Addo that were spared and established in Addo Elephant Park. So there was great massive extinction events but we know that elephants did live in these areas and historical record suggests that they did live in some Fenbos areas, but we also know that Fenbos is very low in nutrients. What does this mean? Elephants are mixed feeders and they are bulk feeders. So they require large amounts of food and they're capable of eating both trees and grasses and have a wide diet. Elephants in fact can eat up to 7% of their body weight every day meaning they can require up to 150 kilograms of plant material uh, every single day. So this raised concerns about bringing elephants back into very highly threatened areas in the Cape because they might be eating endangered plants or endangered plant species, as well as potentially causing habitat degradation. And so we know very little about elephants in how they can cope in these areas. In addition to their food requirements, elephants are really special. They are highly intelligent social animals that require special consideration. They exist in very complex societies of matriarch herds, which are led by the oldest female, um, as well as bull societies, and babies will learn what to eat from their mothers and their aunts because they stay in their family herds throughout their lives and they can live up to 70 or 80 years. So how do elephants cope with learning how to be in famous vegetation and how do they learn what is edible and what isn't? These are some of the questions we set out to answer. And we then came into the first study of free roaming elephants in Fenbos and we wanted a quick easy way to assess how elephants cope in this environment and so we started a partnership with um, the reserve in the Western Cape as well as the Mammal Research Institute of the University of Pretoria 
and we approached Professor Andre Hansvent of the Mammal Research Institute, who's a world leader in wildlife endocrinology. And we decided that this would be an ideal honours project as well for a student um, for their final dissertation project. And so we were joined by a local student from the University of Pretoria, Elisabetta Carlin, who then proceeded to finish her honours on the study. Um, and what we really set out to do was have a look at if elephants were obtaining sufficient nutrients from this environment and if they were stressed living in this environment. And I'll discuss what we mean by stress as well. At the same time as starting the study, we were experiencing a really extreme and prolonged drought within the Cape. You may have heard about the water crisis in Cape Town a couple of years ago and how the dams and taps nearly ran dry. And so the, the drought caused a really interesting situation because food availability would have been really low and this would increase the stressful environment. And so it was the ideal time to look at if elephants were coping in these environments. So what we did was we wanted to have a look at body condition being a proxy for um, nutritional adequacy. And this is done by using a visual assessment using photos. And it was developed by Morfelt and colleagues and published in 2014. And they had a very simple scale of one, which is an emaciated individual, to five, which is an obese individual. And this is based on how much uh, certain features, body features of the animal you can see, such as their ribs or their vertebral ridge or their pelvic bone. And to do this requires taking photographs at different angles to get clear um, vision of the different areas of the animals. And this seems very simple, but it's in fact linked to subcutaneous fat which was measured in zoo animals. And so it's an ideal way to really go out and photograph elephants and use that for science. We also wanted to study stress and stress in wild animals is quite difficult to study. What we mean by stress is animals are constantly confronted with challenges that may be external or internal. And these stresses trigger the hypothalamus command center of the brain, which then releases hormones, including adrenaline, the fight or flight hormone, and glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, which is known as the stress hormone. And cortisol acts in interesting ways to um, increase sugars and enhances the brain's use of glucose so it increases your energy levels and how you may deal with stress and it also represses functions that are non-essential to stress response for example digestion cortisol is excreted in different ways and we can measure cortisol to see how stressed an animal is we can have direct measurements of cortisol from blood samples, for example, or samples may also be extracted from hair or feathers or milk. Um, humans actually get their blood tested for cortisol to see how stressed they are. And interestingly, cortisol levels, you may have experienced this spike early in the morning when as soon as you wake up, which gets your energy ready to face the day and slowly over the daytime, they tend to um, reduce till about midnight when cortisol levels are at their lowest. Cortisol is also metabolized in both the kidney and excreted in urine. And so you can measure urine for cortisol concentrations. It's also metabolized in the liver and passes through the gut to be excreted in samples in feces. And these fecal samples are really what I'm going to be concentrating on because it's proved really interesting way to look at how animals, um, especially wildlife, are stressed and how we can measure that. So fecal glucocorticoid metabolites or FGCM for short 
um, are found in, in dung. And we can measure these because it's non-invasive sampling. That's really important for wildlife because we don't want to stress these animals out um, in order to collect stress samples. So an animal comes along and deposits a dung sample for you very kindly and moves off and you can come and collect that sample without the animal even knowing that you're there. And so it's really opened up the field of wildlife stress studies. It's also interesting because fecal samples are a measure of chronic stress as opposed to acute stress. If you have an acute stress incident, say you get a sudden shock, your blood levels may spike um, and will then drop down. But we want you to get an idea of how animals were stressed in relation to nutrient deficiencies. If animals are spending a long time foraging in environments which are suboptimal and they are having to find a lot of food and process low nutrient food, it's a fairly stressful situation and that would be reflected in chronic stress. And chronic stress in dung is measured over a couple of hours because that's how long it takes for the digestive sample to be deposited. We need to collect these samples very quickly after they have been excreted because the bacteria in the dung will continue to digest the cortisol. So we need to freeze these samples very quickly to freeze the cortisol levels. And we also need to be able to identify the donors so that we can collect several samples from several known individuals to have a look at average cortisol levels. Thankfully, elephants can deposit massive quantities of dung every day, up to 100 kilometers, 100 kilograms, and they do this every three or four hours. So generally, you can sit and watch elephants, and over the course of you watching them, one of the animals will hopefully deposit a dung sample for you. Such as this baby elephant is doing in the bottom right, we get very excited about elephants in the field. But you need to be able to identify elephants. And how do you do this? It's a very well established method um, of identifying elephants because each individual has specific characteristics. We tend to use their ears, which are really unique in that elephants, because they have very thin membraned ears, they tend to get cut up um, quite a lot over the course of their lifetime by passing through thorn bushes, for example, or in fighting with other individuals. And so unique notches in elephant ears can be used to identify them, as well as other characteristics. So while we would go out into the field and collect photos of elephants or take photos of elephants, and from there draw up individual identification kits. You can see in the top, this is a photo of an elephant bull who is defined by lots of notches on his ears, but he also has very thick prominent tusks, which was noted in his ID kit. Contrast the elephant cow in the bottom left has much thinner curved tusks and she has very distinguishing characteristic features on her ears. She has an M-shaped notch in her ear, which we put into our ID kits. And so we would go out and take our ID kits with us into the field and we would then go and try and find elephants in the field. This sounds simpler than it actually is in, in practice. Um, we spend hours in the field trying to wait for elephants and the Murphy's Law of um, wildlife research is that the species that you are looking for will be the species that you cannot find. And elephants are considered silent giants. So they can walk very, very quietly and disappear into bush very, very quickly. So once we find the elephants, we get very, very lucky. We then have to wait for elephants to deposit a dung sample, which is sometimes very easy to see, such as the sample the elephant has just sniffed in the road. And sometimes it's out in the middle of the bush. 
Once we've identified the individual which has dropped the dung, we need to then go and collect that dung. And we have to wait for the elephants to move off before we can go do this. It's not advisable to go and rush off into the field to collect dung samples from wild elephants while they're still milling about. It could prove quite dangerous field work sampling. But we have a very narrow time gap to collect these samples and put them on ice. So we would time the um, point of defecation and try and see exactly the point where the elephant dung was deposited, wait for the elephants to move off, go out into the field and collect the dung sample, which also is incredibly difficult because identifying a particular dung pile in um, shrubland can be very, very difficult. So once that's collected, we come back into the field um, and we also will collect behavioral data from the elephants as well. So the this field work is really interesting in that it's an ideal example of how expert-led volunteering um, can result in really great data collection. Taking photographs and collecting samples can be done by relatively inexperienced um, surveyors. Once the samples were collected, they would come back um, and freeze them and we would sort them, um, as you can see we're doing in the photograph in the bottom. And then they went back to the lab to be um, analysed for cortisol. And I'm not going to discuss how that is done. You can read that in our paper if you're really interested. And we went through our body condition photos to score the individual um, and this was done by several blind experts and we got the median body condition score for each individual elephant. So what did we find? Well, first of all, thankfully, we found elephants depositing a lot of dung and so we got a lot of samples and we had two sampling periods in April and in June of 2018. And these graphs summarize the results very succinctly. We have body condition on the x-axis and that goes, remember, from a body condition score of one, which is emaciated, to five, which is obese. And most of the elephants were occurring between um, 2.5 and three, which is a pretty good score for um, elephants, particularly in the dry season in which we were sampling. And you then have your um, FGCH concentration on the y-axis. Uh, the y-axis increased in June, which you can see. Um, so elephants had, some individuals had higher stress levels in June. But there was no real correlation, no significant correlation between body condition and stress of individuals. What I mean is that thinner individuals who may have had a lower body condition score didn't necessarily have higher stress, suggesting that stress wasn't necessarily related to uh, nutritional status. Now, stress obviously can vary between um, age and sex of individuals, as well as reproductive status or injury. And so there's many different reasons why elephants may have had different stress levels at the time of sampling. But what does this mean? Basically, we compared the results to a couple of other populations using the same established technique. And our levels were equivalent with baseline levels in other populations. And this is significant due to the massive drought we were experiencing at the time. So what this suggests is that elephants can obtain adequate nutrition from fainbos vegetation, but this needs to be monitored over long periods of time. And as scientists, we always want to go out and collect more data, but this showed a very basic way that elephants can exist in fainbos environments that don't seem to be um, causing them particular stress or nutritional deficiencies. And we want to increase this to have a look at now that the drought has ended and how elephants are faring. 
And so the next steps are to increase our sampling as well as to increase our behavioral observational. So we want to really have a look at what elephants are eating in these environments, what tree species and shrub species they're selecting, what grass species they're selecting, um, are they eating different flowers that may be potentially endangered? So what their effects are in the environment, as well as the potential effects um, from increased dung deposition and increased nutrients, which would have been a part of the, the system when elephants were present. And so the very first steps at looking at how elephants can come into a biodiversity hotspot and what this means for both the individual elephants um, in terms of how they can cope in these environments and conservation in, in general. Our study has been published uh, very recently in an open access um, journal and you can access this article at the following link. And I will be answering questions on the study and in elephants and um, biodiversity in general in our Q&A. So if you have got any particular questions, please um, have a look at the study. And just bringing this back to our big picture in terms of conservation, we need to protect elephants in the habitats that they are in. And we also need to create new homes for them. Um, tourism is a way that can do this and it can help protect elephants because people will pay money to see healthy populations of elephants. And this is of relevance, particularly now, um, when tourism has had been essentially cut off uh, due to COVID and a lot of the reserves and a lot of the um, populations are suffering as a result of the reduced inflow of tourists and money. And so we perhaps need to have a look at funding conservation um, using different methods. And this has helped us take a step back and really have a look at how we can help these populations. It's also reminded us that there is still so much that we don't know about elephants. We, for a very long time, have been looking at elephants and their impacts, um, but for the first time ever have brought them back into an area in Africa where they were removed and very different to the savanna and grassland environments where elephants have been studied in the past. And this always reminds me that sometimes the simplest questions are the most interesting. And I think conservationists and young conservationists in particular should always be cognizant of that. Interestingly, for example, um, recent studies have been published in Nature which look at why zebras have stripes, the most very basic of questions. So in doing a very simple study looking at um, elephant body condition and elephant stress, which we were able to collect enough data in one season, we're able to really get a glimpse of bigger picture in terms of how tourism can fund biodiversity hotspot conservation in perhaps ways that we never thought possible before. In conclusion, I would like to say a massive thank you to all of the people involved in the study, including Opwell staff and all of the students that helped collect data and spent hours in the field, um, sometimes in very cold and windy weather, collecting poo samples. Um, and also a big thanks to all of the guides and staff and reserve staff which are involved in our projects. A lot of them are facing very difficult times at the moment because the tourism industry has shut down. And a big thank you to all of the incredible students that I have had the privilege of meeting over the last couple of years of working with Upwell. Some fantastic people, um, some fantastic studies, and we're all missing the expedition this year. I'm sure you are too. And we hope that we can see you very shortly in the future, um, looking at our wonderful landscapes and our wonderful animals that we share with you. 
And if you've got any questions, please come through to the Q&A session. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation.